Hello and welcome to the symposium. My name's Carl and today we're going to be talking about identity, which is something that I have had to do an awful lot of reading on and some of the textbooks that I've been reading present a particular form of thought experiment that helps us deal and, and understand the questions that are raised when we actually try to identify things. So, for example, if we go to sleep in a particular room, how do we know that we wake up in the same room? We can't simply say it's in the same place and the objects in it are unchanged, because that isn't true. The room has moved, because where the Earth revolves around the Sun, uh, the room is not in the same place, and the objects have changed, but in imperceptible ways, such as the movement of air or the deterioration of natural materials. Identity is often considered to be the idea of a thing as being one in the same as itself. And this is what makes them identical. Two different copies of the same book are, in fact, not identical. This makes identity a special form of relation. This is something we call strict identity. Identity as a, true, uh, as a relation true of only an object and itself. For example, if a TV is stolen and the police find a TV of the same model in your house, how do, you, how do they know that it's not the same TV and, therefore, you are the thief. How do they know it is not the thing in and of itself? Another example is Firenze is Florence. These are two different words for the same city, and is marks strict identity, which makes the sentence informative to someone who didn't recognise one of the words was used to denote that city. Other relations typically hold between two or more things. For example, the phrase is the sister of requires a female and a sibling, but is never true of a pair containing a person and themselves. Not all relations are like this. For example, a person who is as tall as can be as tall as oneself, although that would be a redundant thing to say, but it can also be true of someone else. They are as tall as this other person. They're also as tall as themselves. We've learned so much here so far, haven't we? But coming back to the question of the room, when we wonder if the room we wake up in is the same room, we don't mean, are the molecules in this room arranged exactly, uh, and is the room in, in exactly the same place? We are wondering, really, if there is more than one room. We are wondering if the room is strictly identical to the room that we fell asleep in the previous night. This is what we call the re-identification of the room, over any given period of time. It's how we arrive at the question of individuation. What is a room? It would seem that a room is a certain restricted area of space containing certain objects and reachable in certain ways from other locations. After I individuate my room by laying out my parameters, I could say that the room I am considering is one and the same in itself, as in, it is strictly identical. After I sleep in the room, I still think of it as my room, but can I claim that the room in the morning is the same as the room in the evening? I can't simply rely on the fact that things seem to be identical, I surely must consider that there may be more than one room that appears this way. We take for granted the re-identification of objects, and it is not necessarily clear how, when challenged, we take for granted the re-identification of objects, and it is not necessarily clear how, and when we are challenged, we often find trouble justifying it, which is one of the things that we, that we find an attempt to address in John Locke's An Essay Concerning Human Understanding. So he addresses the ideas of identity and diversity, and how he saw these as a continuity of ideas attributed to an object. Locke determined that an object did not occupy the space of another object and could only be in one place at one time with one beginning, and it is possible it is impossible for two things of the same kind to exist in the same space. They are what he called diverse. He determines that we have ideas of three sorts of substances: one, God, an infinite intelligence; two, finite intelligences, which is living creatures, and three bodies, or the material world. God is without beginning or end, he is omnipresent, he, the royal he. Finite spirits are things that occupy a particular place in the universe that determines their identity. 
Bodies means particles of matter that do not have any addition or subtraction in their composition. That's important later. Locke asserts that we can identify these as separate things, and while they might not occupy the same space as each other, these three categories must occupy distinct space from others of the same type. So in Locke's view, God, a person, and a, the person's body might all occupy the same space. God is within all of us. We are also within our bodies, and our bodies are located on, in the world. But these things are all distinct from one another. There is it, A second god won't occupy your space, a second intelligence won't occupy your body, and a second body won't occupy the space in which your body is sat. These things are determined, as Locke described, by their existence in succession, as are motion and thought, which in Locke's view, perish the moment they begin, and can't exist in two different places and at two different times, any subsequent thoughts or motions being different ones altogether. Now, all of this doesn't apply to living beings, in Locke's view. An inanimate object could be categorised by counting atoms, and when one is taken away, you could say the thing is no longer itself. But for living beings, identity is more than just being the same mass of particles. A living being's identity is not applied to the same thing as an object's identity. The body of a living organism is organised in such a way as to have what Locke calls a continuity of life. The form defines the thing, not the specific atoms that make it up. Locke believed that this was very similar in the case of machines, except for the case of organisation of within life, the organisation of motion comes from within the thing, and with a machine it comes from without the thing, as in someone else turns it on. The, identify, the, the identity of a man comes from the continuity of life in a particular body. If it were the identity of the soul alone, how could we know we were talking about only one man? It would be possible that famous historical figures could all be the same man. We might all be the same soul. This is going back to the same problem that Descartes had. Locke suggests that we can distinguish between a substance, a person, and a man, and these three words describe different ideas that can all apply to the same name, which must be its identity. So, to define personal identity, a separate concept, but a, a subcategory of identity, Locke believes that it is, quote, a thinking, intelligent being with reason and reflection that can consider itself using a consciousness that distinguishes itself from other thinking things. Locke asks us to consider whether a prince's soul in a cobbler's body is a prince or a cobbler. It is not enough to say that the soul of a man is his identity, as the body also goes into making the man what he is. As the soul alone does not make the same person, Locke reasons it must be continuity of consciousness that makes the same person, a kind of continuum of self. This consciousness must be connected to the body and is not separated from it if a part of the body, say, for example, your little finger, is amputated. We consider the body to be the seat of consciousness and not the finger. Our personal identity is our consciousness, which is also our sense of self. Distinct consciousnesses are held distinctly accountable. This leads us to the question of whether a man is the same in the past and the present, sober or drunk. Locke reasons that if a person has a distinct incommunicable consciousness at different times, that would make him different persons. And in English, we even have ways of describing that idea. We say he's not himself and things like that, which imply that the self is actually not the same person. However, Locke believes that it is hard to conceive of, say, Socrates, being two persons, so we must revisit what it is meant by Socrates the man, the historical figure. It must be either, one, the same individual, immaterial, thinking substance, the same numerical soul and nothing else, or the same animal without regard to the soul, or the spirit united to the body of Socrates, so the, the entire thing. Locke believes that these three things could exist within the same identity, but could not occupy the same point in time and space as one another, i.e. one god could not inhabit the same universe as another, one finite intelligence could not inhabit the same body as another, and one body could not inhabit the same space as another.
Whichever one you prefer, Locke believes that it is impossible to make personal identity consist of anything but consciousness. The first would allow a consciousness to exist in several bodies in, in, in time, whereas the second and third require a continuity of physical bodies. The people who place human identity in the physical body have no trouble identifying the same person, but those who place it only in consciousness must encounter absurdities such as suggesting a drunk or madman has a separate consciousness in his body that constitutes a different self, and there would be no grounds for punishing his body and the sober self for the actions of the drunk self. It's important to note that personal identity and human identity are distinct concepts that I will define a bit more clearly as we go through this. Locke concludes by reasoning that the self is determined by identity of consciousness. His view on identity and non-identity hinge on the role of the origin of the thing being identified. If we were to go back to the room example, the particular characteristics of the room we are attempting to re-identify can be traced to their origins to help us be sure that we are talking about a single room rather than multiple rooms that just look similar. We might see a particular scuff on the wall where we were moving furniture or something of that nature so that we can identify the origin of the features for which we were personally responsible. This is, of course, not perfect. It could be that somehow you were in a replica of the room that w was created after you fell asleep with such care to detail that we are actually incapable of distinguishing that this is not the same room and we would misidentify the room in which we find ourselves as one and the same as the one in which we fell asleep. The chances of this being the case, though, are obviously going to be pretty low. Why would this have happened to you? When describing thought and motion, such as the swinging of a bat by an arm or the thought of a summer day in your mind, uh, Locke says that there is no persistent thing here to re-identify. He believes, as I said, that both perish the moment they begin and cannot exist in different times. The new thought or action, even if it's designed to mimic perfectly the previous one, is not the same as the original. And I think that he's basically correct here. Any motion that is going to be a reproduction but could not be identified as the original because of its place in time, the original one having ended the previous when it was previously done, and even if we managed to replicate the motion precisely, it would still be a new and separate motion. This also applies to thoughts. So there is no continuity of existence between one motion or thought and the other. They do not have the same origin point in time, and if they did somehow in space... I still don't believe that you could accurately identify them as the same thing. If we do not agree that living things are identified as a continuity of life within a certain form, Locke argues that we are actually left in a tricky position, as it will become difficult to prove that a man is the same man at different stages of his life, as a baby is an old man or when drunk or when sober. If we do not identify a living organism by its physical body, then we are forced to do it by the identity of the soul alone, which puts us back to the problem that Descartes had, identifying just which soul was attached to which body. There is no particular reason that men living in different ages don't share the same soul, and thus would be the same man. He also argued that it would be a strange definition of the word man that did not have any attachments to the physical body of a man himself, meaning that it would be difficult to justify punishing the physical body. He also notes the absurdity that, essentially, we could not, nobody could be sure that the soul of Roman Emperor Heliogabalus was not now in the body of a pig, making the pig, by this definition, the man. On a personal note, I do find Locke's assessment of this convincing. I think that the consciousness is a product of biological processes and cannot be separated from them. When it comes to Locke's question of the prince and the cobbler and whether they are the same man, he distinguishes between the man and the person. The man is the physical body in which the consciousness is located. Locke defines a person as a thinking intelligent being that has reason and reflection and can consider itself as itself the same thinking thing in different times and places. And Locke believed that it is within the person, that same consciousness, that personal identity is found. And that is not, as we've already covered, human identity. I will define that soon. Thus Locke believed that the soul of a prince in a cobbler's body would carry the consciousness of the prince with his own personal experiences and views, but all, all around the world people would only see the body of the cobbler. The person would stay the same, but the man would be different. Although Locke points out that if you lost the finger, you wouldn't consider your consciousness to have resided within the finger, he thinks that this is far from evident, and I think that he's doing himself a disservice here from what he's laid out alone. 
I actually really approve of the distinction between man and person. I think that's very useful. And I think that incidents of brain injury or multiple personality disorder show that a person can substantially change to the point where they are not perceived as and do not believe themselves to be the same person despite inhabiting the same body. And I also, dis- I also agree that his definition of a person as a thinking, self-considering being that is a continuity of consciousness is accurate and useful, as is identifying consciousness to be the source of personal identity. So, if our consciousness is generated by the brain, which it does appear to be, science appears to have corroborated, it is correct that if we lost a finger, which is a part of the man, not part of the person, then we would not consider the finger to be the person, as it isn't the seat of the continued consciousness, and our personal identity would still reside in the rest of our body. This is actually not as concrete as it first appears, however, because if our consciousness is the collection of our thought processes and memories, the question over whose memories they belong to presupposes a personal identity or an identity of some kind. If my memories make up my consciousness, to say my before the memories requires a form of personal identity that exists before the memories, which means our consciousness can't actually be derived from the memories itself. If we ask, am I still the same person if I lose my memories? Locke answers by addressing the I in the question. He believes that I is in reference to one's physical body as a man, which is also to take to stand for the same person. He believes that human laws do not punish a sane man for that which a madman does, and so we could count them as two distinct persons inside the same man. As he points out, we use phrases like he is not himself or he is beside himself to describe this phenomenon. However, using the example of Socrates, he delineates between two ways of viewing the situation one where the consciousness is not connected to the material body, contrasted against one that finds that it is connected in whatever way. The first encounters the same problem as Descartes, and Locke resolves this by concluding that making human identity include the physical body of the man is as the same thing in which we place the personal identity, the person, we resolve the difficulty in allowing a man to be the same person. So your human identity is your personal identity, which is your consciousness, and your physical identity, which is your body, and it is a summarization of those components. And if you believe in God, I am sure that you can include God in that as well. There is a reply to John Locke by Bernard Williams again in The Self and the Future, and his piece is includes a complex thought experiment, which revolves around a science fiction scenario in which persons A and B volunteer to exchange bodies and the hypothetical process this would entail. This is a really complicated bit that I'll probably mess up. I'm going to try and make sure that I've got everything straight. The technical details of the swap are unimportant. The crux of the piece is to establish the procedure that would be followed and the understanding of it from both the, from both the first person and third person perspectives. Because this is Williams believes that the the way that we describe the thing is directly affecting our understanding of the thing. Williams bases the piece around the perspective of A and B once they've been informed that after the body swap, one would be given a huge cash prize and the other would be tortured. So who belongs to what body, and would the person who is moving into a body that is not going to be tortured still have a fear of future pain? Williams points out that the way of analysing the topic from the third-person perspective, which is what we've just done, does not adequately represent the stages of the process from the perspective of one of the subjects in the experiment, say, A. So, to represent it from the first person, he breaks it down into the following six parts. Number one, A is subject to an operation that produces amnesia. Number two, the amnesia and other interference changes A's character. Number three, Along these changes, illusory, fictitious memories are planted in A, and number four, the same as number three, so the the memories are placed in, that belong to B. Number five is the same as four, but the information put into A from B leaves B the same as before. And number six is the same as five, but the operation is performed in reverse on B, and therefore the body swap is hypothetically complete. Is this a true representation? We seem to be rewiring their brains, so do they remain the same person? Is A's consciousness actually in B's body? Is it a continuity of consciousness, or is it something artificial? At what stage does A stop being A and begin being B? 
is a justified in being afraid of what happens after the body swap in regards to the torture his body will endure. There are no clear answers to this without knowing precisely what consciousness exactly entails or what the source of the self is. If our definition of self is the continuity of our consciousness, then it might not even be possible to exchange bodies at all, but only to make each person believe that they have exchanged bodies. If we use technological means to modify the brains of A and B to fool them into believing that they are the other person, we haven't actually moved A to B and vice versa. If we can somehow move the consciousness of A to B, then are we breaking the continuity of consciousness for both? Can they really consider themselves to be the same self? I think it could be more accurately described as A and B have been modified to resemble one another with indistinguishable accuracy. That strikes me as being more correct. Both Williams and Locke are using examples of body swaps to try and understand the concept of identity. But Williams distinguishes his treatment from Locke's example, Locke's one being the, the soul of the prince in the cobbler's body, and Williams being the, the, body, the science fiction body swap between A to B, by centering his view of things on what the person might say about their identity themselves before the operation as well as after. And this allows him to break down the series of stages at which the operation would have to go through in order to help more clearly distinguish how we would come to the conclusion that the bodies have been switched. If the experimenter chooses the outcome for A and B after both opted for which body they would like to see tortured and rewarded, given what they expected to inhabit, so if A was expecting to be in B's body and B is expecting to be in A's body, a would say, well, I would like B's body to get the reward after the operation is complete and A's body, to, uh, my, you know, my body, A's body, to be tortured, then the one that chose not to be tortured after the swap and then is tortured will complain that this is not what they chose. The one that is rewarded will also express satisfaction that his choice was confirmed, showing that to care about what happens to me in the future does not necessarily mean my body. If A chooses that A's body gets the money, and B's body gets the pain, and B chooses conversely, and the experimenter gives A the reward and B the torture, the, the consciousness, not their body, both would have to agree that A got what A wanted, but A will not like the outcome because he will be in B's body. Williams is suggesting that his examples demonstrate that A and B do not believe bodily continuity is required for continuity of personal identity. Williams sets up another little thought experiment in which he considers that if one were to be told that they would be tortured and then have their memory erased before the torture, as in uh, they, they felt they were out of the body, then that would be no relief. Even if one had gone mad and believed themselves to be another person, it should be of little comfort. Even if we were guaranteed to have the replacement memories of someone else, the proper reaction would still be fear. Williams has shown, really, that from the first-person perspective, it appears that it is not possible to change bodies, and the process would in fact describe a process of artificially modifying someone's thought pattern to accurately resemble the other. However, the person remains the same consciousness, just modified. He notes after his six-point breakdown of the first-person process of changing one person into another that there is no obvious point in the process at which A's fears should not be about A's body. Because we are effectively rewiring A's brain to simulate B's brain, there is no place at which we can draw a clear line between them. In addition, we cannot address A's fears because the process is usually described by an outsider. Then he gets into a horribly complex situation, which I'm going to skip through, because Williams does have a meandering writing style. But what Williams is trying to say is that our concept of a person is not fully coherent, and so we must relax our concept of personhood. There are two strategies presented. The first is undecidability. We have the concept of a person, as well as the concept of the same person, and there can be borderline cases, why should we be uneasy about this borderline status? The second strategy is the conventionalist, which is to recognize that these examples are difficult, and so we just wait until our experimental subjects decide the matter for themselves. Williams concludes that in his thought experiment, the changing of bodies is actually an artificial construct that is a neat sleight of hand to describe a process that does not actually move a separate entity of the consciousness, 
but instead rewires brains in order to simulate it, which could be stopped or altered at any stage in the process to create a duplicate of one person. He suggests that it could be resolved by some model that involved ghostly persons, inhabiting bodies in the same way Descartes considered the consciousness to do, and only then might it be possible to consider the bodies actually swapped. So, to summarise all of this, the way that we identify things is actually very complex. It's actually very difficult to pin it down, and any time we do try to pin it down, it, it is something that can be attacked from many different angles in order to bring doubt into one's own ability to identify the things around them or what they themselves are. So if someone tries to attack your identity, you should probably be asking yourself, what's in it for them?